What's up, everybody? Happy post Thanksgiving Monday. I want to thank you for joining me today on our Poop Scoop Monday. Yay! 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 All right, let's do this. All right, guys, if you're joining for the first time, my name is Dr. Islam, and yes, I am your poop guru. My passion is to give you guys the to make sure you can get your gut health taken care of. Thank you for joining today on a Monday. All right, let me know if you guys are watching this live or on the replay. You know the drill. Also, let me know where you guys are watching this ad so we can see the, the person who is the furthest out. So far, we got Pennsylvania ran. Pennsylvania, thank you for watching on the live stream. Days, thank you for watching. Raymond, thank you for watching. Christina, thank you for watching. Alexa, thank you for watching. Rand, thank you for watching. And thank you for watching, everybody. All right, we have some great questions today. So if you're joining for the first time, uh, every Monday, go live on my social media streams. Answer your questions, your own personal office hours with your poop guru. I also do some deep dives, some topics. So let me know if you have a question for me and I have a great show planned for today. All right. First of all, how was your Thanksgiving? Let me know in the comments down below. We went home to Odessa, where I am from, had my mom's food, which is so great. And yes, I had my favorite dessert of all. I, I cannot speak, sorry. And yes, I had my favorite dessert of all time, pecan pie. Oh my gosh, let me know in the comments down below if you guys are fanatic about pecan pie, because I am. I love my pecan pie uh watched a lot of great football as well i, I gotta say man my longhorns we killed it sorry i right, listen i know some of you guys may be tech fans i'm sorry we killed it welcome to the sec longhorns i was so happy we had a great game as well uh so i'm still continuing my journey into watching old movies so i introduced my kids to dumb and dumber oh my gosh they hated this movie. They did not like that at all. They thought it was a terrible movie, so they were not happy with that at all. So they were not happy. Let me know in the comments down below if you guys have any movie recommendations. We're going through the whole 90s kick. So I think that we're going to try and maybe try, uh, you know, we've done, let's see, Primal Fear. Uh, we did, obviously, the, we did Count of Monte Crisco. Uh, we have done uh, Jerry Maguire. We just finished Dumb and Dumber. So let me know in the comments down below what other movies you guys have as well. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and start with some of our topics. I'm excited for our first topic. In our first topic, we'll talk about heartburn in the holidays. What is going on? So what can you do? So you may be having issues with or wondering what you can do to manage your heartburn during the holidays. In this video, I'm gonna give you my tips that I recommend so you can hopefully manage your heartburn when it comes during the holidays. So why do we get heartburn especially during the holidays. It's not just related to your family members who may be the people you don't want to hang out with. No, it's not just that. It is down to what we're eating and also our typical routines that we do with our family. So the holidays, like we just had, can really cause you to eat some really high fat foods, high carbohydrate foods, and also you're maybe not in your normal routine of getting about. So it's very common around this time of year for your heartburn to get worse. What can you do to make sure your heartburn does not control you during the holidays? Here are my tips. So number one, always remember, have mindful eating practices. What do I mean? Sorry. What do I mean by this? So what I mean by this is really understanding what you are putting in your body. Too many of us, including myself, we just eat and eat and eat because we see the food that we enjoy and we want to have more of it. But we're not mindful of this. I made this mistake over the Thanksgiving holiday where I ate a ton, not because I was hungry, because I just wanted to eat. And I suffered the consequences with my heartburn with that. So be mindful of what you're eating. Know exactly what you're putting in your mouth and make sure you actually are eating because you are hungry and not just because you got into the habit of eating or because you're around people who are eating as well. So really practice mindful eating. All right, tip number two, you may want to opt for smarter food choices. So if you have a choice between having something that's full calories, full fat, full carbohydrates, maybe choose a lighter option. So for example, cauliflower rice is a great substitute for regular rice. 
Whole grains like sourdough is a great substitute for complex grains. Maybe having some berries instead of having that cranberry sauce is a great substitute. Have low fat or no fat milk instead of full fat milk. Have diet drinks instead of regular Coke. Use these things, make smarter choices so you can still enjoy what you're eating and have that taste, but that way you don't have to worry about anything else that could be causing your gut to go out of whack. So I have found that using smarter choices can help out. Minimize the dressing, minimize the spice, dab your food into that dressing instead of pouring it all in there. These are things that will help out when it comes to heartburn. All right, tip number three, try to see if you can stay upright for at least two or three hours after you eat. Too many of us, including yours truly, we eat, we sit on the couch, we just want to watch TV. That is not good for your heartburn symptoms. So you want to try and see if you can stay upright for at least two or three hours after you eat to make sure your food can digest and use gravity as a way to allow you to not have bad acid reflux symptoms. It works, it's very fantastic. It can really help out when it comes to heartburn issues. Also, I would recommend maybe before you go to bed, make sure you don't eat immediately before. Wait a little bit, wait at least three hours before you lie down to go to bed because that's going to make it easier for you to hopefully manage your issues and not have as much heartburn issues as well. Next tip is to moderate or have moderate alcohol usage. Now I know during the holidays people like to drink and enjoy their time but if you can minimize that or moderate that or not have as much or maybe have a drink of water in between that alcohol can damage your esophagus and stomach to cause worsening heartburn symptoms, worsening bloating, and worsening distension as well. So try to find a better way to moderate or minimize your alcohol use. And then lastly, I know it's hard to say this, but have the vegetables and the plants as the biggest part of the meal. You want to load your plate with salad, vegetables, plants. I did this during Thanksgiving because it kept me full and I loved it. It was good. So try to make the biggest part of your meal the vegetables, and the plants. These are my tips that I recommend to get rid of heartburn during the holidays. Let me know in the comments down below what you would what you would add. Sorry. Let me know in the comments down below what you would add to this list. What would you change? What would you and what would you improve? What would you not improve? So we can all all benefit from the comments you guys have uh, as well. All right. So let's go through some of the questions that we have here. So um Ran asked, why is it so hard to treat H. pylori? Very good question. It really comes down to the resistance that we have to antibiotics. Antibiotics, unfortunately, is used to treat everything, whether it's a viral infection or maybe you don't actually don't need antibiotics. So you get what are called antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And H. pylori is a very common bacteria that is present. They can become resistant to so many different antibiotics that you use, specifically clarithromycin. <clears throat> Sorry, specifically clarithromycin. And this is a reason why it's very hard to treat H. pylori. The second reason is that if you treat H. pylori, you typically have to give at least a 10-day course of at least three or four antibiotics. They can cause a lot of GI symptoms. So a lot of my patients, unfortunately, do not finish the treatment regimen. And if they don't finish it, this means that your stomach will become resistant to that H. pylori, which will make it harder to treat. And so with the prevalence of how much antibiotics is used across the United States, with antibiotics being used for all sorts of conditions, that coupled with the fact that the H. pylori treatment can be rough for our patients and they may not finish their antibiotics, these are multiple reasons why it can be difficult to treat H. pylori. If that's the case, sometimes we have to use special treatments, do special testing to see exactly what antibiotics your H. pylori may be resistant to. Let me know in the comments down below if you have a question about H. pylori that I can maybe address in future videos as well. All right, if you're joining for the first time, my name is Dr. Islam. Yes, I am your poop guru. My passion is to give you guys the best tips and tricks so you can live your best life. If you haven't already, let me know if you're watching this live or in the replay. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, let me know where you guys are watching this at so far. So far, Rand is the leader with Pennsylvania. Give me some likes, guys. Come on, I want some likes. Give me some likes. Yes. Go for those likes. Let's see if we can get to at least 20 likes today. And let me know in the comments down below if you have a question I can answer uh, as well. So um, 
We were talking about some videos, so I appreciate that. Uh, Ace Ventura, yes, I'm going to introduce my kids to that for sure. And The Parent Trap, oh, my kids have already watched The Parent, yeah, the Parent Trap. They love that. That is a great uh, movie to watch as well. All right, so um, question, Rosalia asks, can pecan pie cause diverticulitis? I love this question because it gets into the heart of of exactly what is diverticulitis. Let's talk about this. So what exactly is diverticulitis? Diverticulitis is inflammation of the pockets in your colon called diverticulosis. Now, 40% of the US population has diverticulitis, but I can guarantee you 40% of the population does not have diverticulitis. So if you have an infection of the osis, it leads to itis. How do you get these infections? The most common reason to get an infection in the diverticulosis is a piece of poo getting stuck in those pockets causing inflammation to occur. Now the only way to diagnose this is with a CAT scan, meaning you cannot come to my office and say that your diverticulitis is acting up without a CAT scan because it's not going to happen. We need CAT scan confirmation of this because there are a lot of other reasons why you can have that pain that's there. And typically we will treat it with the course of antibiotics. Here's what you need to know though. What can trigger diverticulitis? Here's what you need to know. Number one, we know that a high meat diet can make diverticulitis worse. Number two, we know a diet that's low in fiber can make diverticulitis worse. We know number three, taking anti-inflammatory medications, Aleve, Naproxen, Advil, Motrin will make diverticulitis worse. Number four, we know that smoking will make diverticulitis worse. What we also know is that certain foods will make diverticulitis worse. Guess what's not on that list? Nuts, seeds, popcorn. There is no evidence that those foods will cause you to have diverticulitis. So if you want to enjoy that pecan pie and you don't want to worry about it, don't worry about it. There is no evidence that these certain foods that people have heard about or read about will make diverticulitis worse. We don't have any evidence. It's an old wise self. I have a lot of videos on this on my YouTube channel, my Facebook channel. So go and watch those where you can get more information on that. It's a great question that I got. All right, next topic. Hey, Dr. Islam, what are the different symptoms of GERD outside of heartburn? So did you know you can have other symptoms that can also be related to heartburn that is not the typical burning in your chest. Here are some of them. Number one, regurgitation. That wonderful feeling of stuff coming up into your esophagus, into your mouth, that is also a symptom of GERD that's not like typical heartburn. So sometimes patients will feel this bitter taste in their mouth or a sour taste. That is regurgitation. Number two, chronic cough. If you're coughing all the time, there are a couple reasons why, and one of them is actually GERD. When GERD goes into your lungs, that can irritate your lungs to cause a chronic cough to occur. Very common reason to uh, have that, and that could be related to GERD. Number three, hoarseness or sore throat. Did you ever have, wonder, man, my throat is sore. What is going on? Why am I hoarse all the time? That is when the acid goes from your stomach into your vocal cords to cause that hoarseness to occur. That can be a symptom of GERD as well. Next is trouble swallowing or dysphagia. It is never normal for food or water to get stuck in the esophagus. If you have that, even though you don't have heartburn, that is a sign of GERD that needs to be investigated. And then lastly, having asthma-like symptoms, that wheezing sensation. Once again, when acid goes into your soft, when, sorry, once again, when acid goes into your lungs, that can irritate your lungs and cause the wheezing to occur. So you have asthma, you don't know why, or you have uncontrolled asthma, we can't control it. Sometimes controlling your GERD can manage that. So if you have these issues, come see someone like me where we can investigate why you're having, what is going on. We can delve into the root cause of why you're having GERD or atypical GERD. Let me know in the comments down below if you've suffered from symptoms like that and come see us up at Gastro where we can get this taken care of for you as well. All right, I'm, if you're joining for the first time, my name is Dr. Islam, and yes, I am your poop guru. My passion is to give you the right information every Monday. If you haven't already, don't forget to smash that like button. We're at 16, guys. Yay. Good job. 
Good job, guys. Uh, and so we'll see if we get to 20. And come see us a little bit gas show for all your GI needs. We can find out exactly what is going on. All right. A couple other questions here I'm seeing. So do you need do you need to have antibiotics for SIBO? Great question. So let's talk about this. So SIBO is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. This is an overgrowth of bad bacteria that very commonly can cause dissension, bloating, nausea, and diarrhea. About 20% of the patients who have what's called IBS or irritable bowel syndrome actually may be having SIBO as a root cause for that. Now let me tell you, when you have SIBO, the evidence suggests using antibiotic regimens. And this is what the evidence shows. So we give different antibiotics, which we can give rifaximin, sometimes Cipro, sometimes Augmentin. But the evidence is with using antibiotic regimens. Now, there are people out there that may want to consider using herbal therapies or dietary options. That is perfectly fine. But I will tell you, based on the evidence, we don't have any good clinical trials that suggest that will help out. However, in some individuals, I will recommend that in the right setting and in the right patient. But the evidence does show that using antibiotics is the most effective way to get rid of SIBO and to make sure it doesn't come back, or at least to minimize the risk of this coming back in the future or delaying that return of those symptoms. So if you have SIBO, I would recommend for you to get an antibiotic treatment to get this taken care of. Let me know in the comments down below if you have a question about this or any more information you want to know. I have a lot of videos about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth on my YouTube channel and my Facebook channel uh, as well. All right, perfect. All right, um, next question. Hey, Dr. Islam, what are the best probiotic strains to help with your gut? Listen, you guys have been asking me about probiotics for years. So I'm going to give you the four strains that I've found to be the best. Uh, sorry. Uh, f yeah. Five strains. I thought, I thought so. So I'm going to give you the five strains you should look for in a probiotic to make sure it has the right type of strain that you eat. Now, not every probiotic may have all five, but at least make sure they have at least two or three of these strains when you're looking for the best probiotic from your poop guru. All right, strain number one, Lactobacillus acidophilus. This is typically found in yogurt and in fermented foods. It's a very effective probiotic strain that can hopefully allow you to manage your gut microbiome and to allow you to have better bowel habits as well. It's number one. Number two, Bifidobacterium bifidum. This also has a very effective option when it comes to probiotics. It allows you to break down complex carbohydrates and actually is, helps to manage your gut microbiome as well. Commonly, this is found in fermented dairy products. That's number two. Number three is Lactobacillus raminosus or R-H-A-M-N-O-U-S. This has been this is a strain that's been shown to help improve your GI health and also your immune health as well. And this is also found in fermented foods like sauerkraut and also in certain yogurts as well. The next strain you should keep an eye out for is Saccharomyces boulardii. This is actually one of the very few yeasts that actually is very effective to help control diarrhea and prevent diarrhea as well. And we typically use this in a supplemental form. And then lastly, we have Bifidobacter longum. This also is a bacteria strain that's found in fermented dairy and also in supplements as well. This also helps to maintain inflammation as well. So if you can find a probiotic that has at least a couple of these five strains, these are the ones that I look for when I'm recommending a probiotic to my patients to see what's going to be the best option for them. If you want to see what you can do to hopefully improve your gut microbiome, this is going to be a great option for you. So look for probiotics down below. Let me know in the comments down below if you want me to do more information, more videos on probiotics that I recommend to hopefully improve your gut microbiome as well. And I have a lot of information on my YouTube channel as well. And come see us on a gas show where you can find out exactly if you need a good probiotic or not, or what is the evidence for that. All right, if you're joining for the first time, my name is Dr. Islam, and every Monday I go live to answer your questions you guys have. If you haven't already, don't forget to smash that like button. We're at 19, let's get to 20. Let me know if you're watching this live or on the replay, and also let me know where you guys are watching this at as well. And come see us, Love a for all your GI needs. All right.
All right, perfect. Taz, thank you for watching. Alexa, thank you for watching uh, as well. All right, so Cora asks, is the pill camp safe if you have inflammatory bowel disease? A very good question. Let's talk about this. So IBD or inflammatory bowel disease is part of the spectrum of either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Now, ulcerative colitis typically only affects the colon. In fact, that's the only where, only place that you have ulcerative colitis is in the colon. This is different from Crohn's disease where it can affect anywhere in your gut. The most common location for Crohn's disease typically is in the small intestine, specifically called the terminal ileum. That's an area that can be inflamed, irritated, and actually can become narrowed as well. So when someone has inflammatory bowel disease and we suspect Crohn's disease, and we know that Crohn's disease commonly affects the terminal ileum or the small intestine, how do we find out? Well, there are two ways for us to know if your small intestine is inflamed. One is with typically an enterography, either an MR enterography or a CT enterography. This is a very special radiology test that allows us to see what is going on in the small intestine. Option number two, option number one. Sorry, that's option number one. Option number two is that we can do what's called a pill cam. This is a small camera about this big that takes pictures all throughout your small intestine and you carry a camcorder with you as well. And it downloads those images from the pill to the camcorder. We can look at it and see exactly the degree of inflammation in the actual small intestine as well. Now, there are some risks with the pill cam. The biggest risk is that it can get stuck in an area in the small intestine where it's narrowed. Now, that risk is pretty small. Typically, it's less than 5%, even in those that may have a small stricture. But... If it does get stuck, we call that a therapeutic complication. Why? Because guess what? If that part of your small intestine is stuck, guess what's going to happen? It's going to have to get removed anyway, surgically. And so letting that pill cam get sucked allows the surgeon to know where to focus on. and also allows us to see what is going on as well. So there is a chance it can get stuck. We call that a therapeutic complication. And in the setting of Crohn's disease, this is something certainly they want to investigate to see exactly what is going on and what could be the cause for that as well. Great question. All right, perfect. All right. Um, next topic. All right. Next question. Hey, Dr. Islam, I'm getting tested for GERD. What are the different tests that we can do to find out if I have GERD or not? So let's talk about exactly what are the options when it comes to GERD? So today, we're going to unravel the mystery of GERD and find exactly what testing we do here at Lubbock Gastro. So we know that GERD or gastroesophageal, or gastroesophageal reflux disease affects about 20% of all Americans. And what typically happens is that when that acid goes up into the esophagus because of the sphincter being not working correctly, that causes the symptoms of GERD to occur. And, it's, and, and whenever somebody has that, we want to find out exactly is this the case or what is going on? So the first step, obviously, is for us to get a good history. A good history alone can give us exactly what we need to find out exactly if you have GERD or just something else going on. The next thing we want to consider doing is, is what? Sorry, the next thing we want to consider doing is to do what's called an EGD or an upper endoscopy. This is where we use a very small camera. We we'll take a look inside the esophagus and see the reason why you're having GERD. We can check for inflammation, we can check for damage, but also we can check to see if there is a hernia that could be contributing to your reflux symptoms. We do know that from long-standing acid reflux, you can get severe damage to the point where it actually can lead to ulcers and even cancer. And taking a look visually with an upper endoscopy is where we can actually see what is going on. The good thing about the upper scope is that it takes about 10 or 15 minutes, you're asleep the whole time. And then while you're asleep, we can take a look and give you the answer why. Why are you having reflux? What is going on? Why are you having pain? And is there a hernia that could be contributing? What's going on? Another test we can do is what's called pH testing. Now, this is a more specific test in which allows us to actually see how much acid is going up into the esophagus. So we know the root cause of acid reflux is a defunct lower esophageal sphincter. It's not working correctly. So it's, it's like having the door wide open and all this acid, acid just rushes back in. So it literally is having that door wide open and having all that acid rush in. What a pH testing does is it allows us to objectively measure how that valve is working. Is it open longer 
and more often is that not doing things the way it should be so we can objectively measure how much acid is going up. So this is a necessary test for us to determine is it truly acid the cause of your issues or there's something else going on. The next test we do is called an esophageal manometry test. This is a test for us to see is there a problem with the muscles of the esophagus. If the muscle of the esophagus are not working correctly, this could be a reason why you're having acid reflux or it could be a reason why you're having trouble swallowing. And the treatment for that is very different than the treatment of typical acid reflux symptoms. And so we use all these tests to tailor the therapy to you specifically so we can give you the best options is the best option medical therapy is the best option getting your hernia fixed is your best option lifestyle changes or is your best option maybe natural herbal therapies by using all these testing we can answer that specific question for you to tailor the options so we can hopefully get you feeling better and with our approach we have been able to get our patients significant improvement and in, and, and improvement of their symptoms improving their quality of life, and minimizing their acid reflux. So if you suspect you have GERD, don't wait. At Lubbock Gastro, come see us. We can find out what's going on, tackle it, get your GERD taken care of, hopefully get you feeling better as well. Come see us at Lubbock Gastro, where hopefully we can give you the lifetime treatment and cure to get your acid reflux fixed as well. I know a lot of patients have questions on this or had asked me about this, I really want to do a deep dive on the testing that we can do to really cure your acid reflux. All right, perfect. All right, so Deb asks, and I love you that he asked this question, why don't gastroenterologists test for low acid? Um, we do. I think Deb, that is literally the testing that we do. We check for low acid with the testing that we do when it comes to your acid reflux. So when I do pH testing, when I test the acid going up, this exactly is what we're doing. We're checking to see if the acid content is too low, is it normal, or is there something else going on there? And if you come see us up gastro, we can do the testing to see, is it an acid problem? Is it a sphincter problem? What is going on so we can hopefully delve into what the issue is to get you feeling better? Thank you, Deb. You, you led into the question that I just talked about as well. Great question. And I appreciate you coming to see us for that. All right, perfect. All right, so Taz, I'm going to get to your question in a long video, but if you can do me a favor, um, I will keep this, and I will actually probably do a live on this, I think, next week. I'll go into more details. I'm actually going to do a long video on this. Great question, so thank you, Taz, for that. All right, uh, last question. We're running out of time here, so great. I, here's my favorite. Sorry, I think this is going to be my favorite question for the uh, for the day. So, Dr. Islam, I got floating poo. What is going on? And why does it happen? Let me know in the comments down below if you suffer from floating poo. Ah, oh my goodness. All right. Why does your poo float? Here are five reasons why. Number one, you actually may be eating a lot of fiber. Fiber is great for you. I am a fan of fiber. I'm a fiber fanatic. But having a lot of fiber actually has a weird side effect of making your poo float. And that's okay. This is because your body does not fully digest fiber and thereby it makes your poop lighter and less dense. So these fibers include things like whole grains, fruits, green leafy vegetables. And the takeaway is that's okay. It's safe. I want you to stick to your fiber diet. The second reason is that you actually may be having excess gas. So gas in your gut makes your poop less dense which allows it to float. So it's very similar to inflating a balloon, except that whenever you have the helium on there, you swip that you swap that for just farts and it keeps that and it keeps that stool floating. So farting for a lot of reasons or farting up a storm can actually be due to a lot of different reasons. So we know that high fiber food so we know that high fiber food can do that. We know that Physiocarbonated drinks can do that. We know that chewing gum can do that. We know sucking in hard candy can do that. We also know that artificial sweeteners like sorbitol can cause you to have a lot of gas to cause your stools to float as well. Once again, this is not typically something to worry about. Just kind of keep it on your diet and see if you need to make some changes with that. Reason number three why your food may, or reason number three why your stool may float is malabsorption. 
This is the medical term when you actually don't absorb enough nutrients from food. Now, there are a couple of different reasons why. The most common one is lactose intolerant. A lot of us, including yours truly, actually lose the ability to digest milk as you get older. And so when you lose that capability, you actually start to malabsorb dairy, which can cause your stools to float. This can be due to, this can cause a lot of gas, diarrhea, or abdominal pain after you have dairy. Number two is that you actually may be losing fat. You may be malabsorbing fat called steatorrhea. This is a, it can be a symptom of either celiac disease or pancreas issues as well. Number three is that you could have a bile acid problem as well, which would impede your ability to absorb fats and cause your stools to float. If your stools float commonly, if you see some oil, this may be the culprit. This is the time to come see something like me to find out exactly what is going on so we can determine if you are malabsorbing a particular condition. Reason number four is that you actually may have a condition called irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. A lot of patients, millions of patients suffer from IBS. And this can be due to an imbalance of your gut microbiome, low-lying inflammation, or certain food allergies or food intolerances as well. And one of the symptoms could be floating stools. And so if you're having other issues like abdominal pain, nausea, distension, and you're having floating stools, come see us a gastro. We can investigate if you have this problem as well. And then lastly, number five, it could be a pancreas problem. We know that chronic pancreatitis can lead to the inability to absorb fats, which can also lead to people to have floating stools as well. So we know that this is a very common cause for that. Now, when do you need to see a doctor if you have floating stools? Well, Sorry, so when do, you see, when do you need to see a doctor when you have floating stools? Here are my recommendations. So number one, if you have floating stools with a lot of diarrhea, especially the diarrhea wakes up in the middle of the night and you have weight loss associated with that as well. This is not normal. We need to find out exactly what is going on. Number two, you have floating stools. Number two, if you have floating stools with a lot of abdominal pain, that pain is not normal when you have floating stools. So if you have that, you need to find out what is going on so we can investigate and get you taken care of as well. Number three, if you have blood in your stool and your stool floats, that is not normal. Get that investigated. Conceal GI doctor to find out what is going on. And then number four, you have unintentional weight loss with floating stools. Weight loss, we, we, weight loss we all may want, but unintentional weight loss is what we don't want. So if you have those conditions, conceal stool gastro, we can find out exactly what's going on and really delve into those particular issues to get you taken care of. All right. Ah, I'm exhausted. Day after Thanksgiving. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for watching today. If you have a question, send them to me. Join me next week. I have these videos. I, if you have any questions, join, watch my YouTube page, subscribe to my channel, watch my Facebook, watch my Facebook page. Thank you for watching. See you at Gas Show. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next Monday.